with Unit 9. This is, video is about learning target 9C, which is the second part of solving quadratic equations. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to solve a quadratic equation using the quadratic formula and determine how many real numbered solutions a quadratic equation has by using the discriminant. In our last two videos, we've talked so far about solving quadratic equations by graphing. That's one method that we've already talked about, and we're actually going to review that a little bit in this video as well. The second method we've talked about is using square roots. And in our last video, we talked about how to solve using the zero product property. This next method that we're going to learn how to solve actually works for any quadratic equation. So in our first three methods when we talked about them, we talked about the fact that graphing probably we only want to use if it's a function that's easy to graph right away. Otherwise this method, although it will work for any quadratic equation, can be rather time consuming. The second method for square roots, remember, only works if our b term is equal to zero, so we don't have that linear piece of it. And the zero product property works only if it can be first factored. And not every quadratic equation can be written in factored form, so the zero product property only works on those that we can factor. The quadratic formula is going to be the fourth method that we're talking about, and this will actually work on any quadratic equation. Now just because it works on any quadratic equation doesn't mean I would recommend it to be the first thing that you try. Using square roots and using the zero product property can actually be a lot quicker and a lot easier if you have a problem that is designed for one of those. So if I have a quadratic equation and I don't have a B term, I'm going to immediately use square roots just because it's going to be easier than trying to compute the quadratic formula, although the quadratic formula would work. Same thing with a quadratic equation, if I notice right away that I can factor that quadratic equation, then the zero product property would be probably quicker and faster than trying to use the quadratic equation or the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula says that if I have a quadratic equation in standard form, so remember our standard form here is ax squared plus bx plus c, so if I have a quadratic equation in standard form, of course my a term can't be zero, otherwise this wouldn't be quadratic. Then my two solutions, or up to two solutions, would be x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c. And notice this b squared minus 4 times a times c is all underneath the square root. Then that whole thing is divided by 2a. So make sure that you're not only dividing the square root term by 2a, but the entire numerator here, including the negative b. That will produce our solutions for our quadratic equation, and we could potentially have up to two solutions with this. Let's jump in and do a couple examples. So these examples say solve the following quadratic equation by using the quadratic formula. In our first one, we have x squared minus 8 equals 2x. To get this into standard form, I need to subtract the 2x to the other side. So we'll have x squared minus 2x minus 8 equals 0. The reason I wrote the 2x in front of the 8 was to make sure that it is in standard form. Now that we're in standard form, I'm going to identify my a, my b, and my c values so it will be easier when I'm substituting into the quadratic formula. Our a value here is going to be 1, since I have that invisible 1 in front of the x squared. The b value is going to be negative 2, since that's the coefficient on the x term, and we want to make sure we're taking the sign with it. And then our constant term here is our negative 8. I can now set up the quadratic formula. So I'll start with my x equals, since that's what I'm solving for. I start off with negative b. So my negative b, I'm going to sub in a negative 2 in place of the b value. So I end up with a negative times a negative, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so negative 2 squared, making sure that that whole term is in parentheses, since I'm squaring both the 2 and the negative sign, minus 4 times our a term times our c term. So 4 times 1 times negative 8, and I'm extending over that square root since all of that is underneath it. 
all divided by two times our A value. I think this is a really good first step for anybody. No matter how long you've been solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula, it's really easy to accidentally misplace a number. So the more work that you show and you write out, the more partial credit you can earn on a learning check. I'm going to start simplifying terms down here now. So negative times a negative 2 will give us a positive 2. Plus or minus, in now inside our square root, negative 2 squared is going to give us positive 4. And then I have a negative 4 times a 1, so still negative 4, times a negative 8 will end up giving us a positive 32. All over 2 times 1 will give us 2. From here, I'm going to continue to simplify underneath the square root. So I still have 2 plus or minus. Now I end up with the square root of 36 all over 2. Notice although 2 divided by 2 does reduce down, I can't cancel these yet because the 2 in the denominator is over both of those pieces. So what I'm going to do in a second is actually split this apart into two separate terms with the plus or minus sign dividing them. Before I do that though, we can simplify the square root of 36. It happens to be a perfect square and the square root of 36 is equal to 6. If we didn't have a perfect square here, that's okay. We do want to simplify any square roots down as much as we possibly can. So if there are perfect squares inside, we'll want to make sure we factor them out. Now from here, I'm going to split this into two terms because both the 2 and the 6 are being divided by the 2 in the denominator. So this is really equal to 2 over 2 plus or minus 6 over 2. And one of the most common mistakes I've seen over the years is uh, forgetting to divide both of them through by that 2 times a term. So I think it's helpful to leave it all as one fraction until you're ready to actually split them apart. From here I want to reduce down and simplify as much as I can. So 2 over 2 is equal to 1. I still have my plus or minus and then 6 over 2 reduces down to be 3. Now from here I can continue to simplify these since I can take 1 plus 3 and I can also do 1 minus 3. So the plus or minus sign is representing two equations. It's representing 1 plus 3, and it's representing if I have 1 minus 3. Since both of those can be simplified, our final answers we're going to end up with is x equals 4, and then x equals negative 2. And those will be our two final answers for this problem. Let's look at our second example here. So in our second example, we have x squared minus 4x equals 21. We have to make sure that we are in standard form. Is this quadratic equation in standard form? So this quadratic equation is not in standard form since standard form would have it equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract 21 over and get x squared minus 4x minus 21 equals 0. Now that I'm in standard form, why don't you guys go ahead and identify the a, the b, and the c values. So our a value is going to be 1, our b is negative 4, and our c value is negative 21. Now that we have this information, we can go ahead and substitute it into the quadratic formula. So I'm getting x equals negative b, so negative times the negative 4 plus or minus the square root of b squared, so negative 4 squared, minus 4 times the a value, which is 1, times the c value, which is negative 21. All of that is underneath our radical. All of that is then divided by 2 times our a value, or 2 times 1. Simplifying this down, we end up with 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 from the negative 4 squared plus 84. Since I have the negative 4 times the negative 21, I end up with a positive all over 2. From here, we can simplify underneath that radical a little bit more, and we get 4 plus or minus the square root of 100 all over 2. Again, I want to make sure I don't just divide the 4 by 2. I'm dividing both terms, the 4 and the square root of 100. So I'm going to continue to write the division bar. From here, I want to simplify the square root of 100 if possible. 
and 100 is a perfect square, so we can reduce that down to be 10, since the square root of 100 is equal to 10. From here, I'm going to break this apart into our two terms. So we get 4 divided by 2 plus or minus 10 divided by 2. Each one of those fractions can be reduced, and we end up with 2. Whoops. There we go. We end up with 2 plus or minus 5. Now, because these are both uh, real numbers that we can add together since they're like terms, we're going to finish off simplifying, and we're going to simplify 2 plus 5 and then 2 minus 5. Let's make sure we have enough space here. So our final answers then for x are going to be x equals 7 and x equals negative 3. So in both of our first two examples, we ended up getting a perfect square underneath the radical sign, which can happen sometimes. And when it does, we want to make sure we simplify all the way down to our final two, maybe integer values or fractions that we might end up with. Now, if we don't have a perfect square underneath the square root, we'll just want to simplify this as much as we can by reducing down the square root as much as possible. Okay, let's look at example three. So example 3 says 2x squared plus 10x plus 3 equals 0. Is this equation in standard form? This equation is in standard form, so we can go ahead and find our a, our b, and our c values. Our a value is going to be 2, our b value will be 10, and our c value will be positive 3. Why don't you guys pause the video and set up the quadratic equation right now? So do that first step of substituting in for a, b, and c, and then we'll check it together. Let's check our set our setup here. So I start off with negative b, so I have negative 10, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 10 squared, minus 4 times the a value, which is 2, times our c value, which is 3. All of that is underneath the square root. And then I divide that entire uh, numerator there by 2 times our a value, so 2 times 2. So double check your setup right now. It's really important that we want to make sure we're setting up the pieces correctly, and it does take practice just to remember We'll first memor oops, memorize what that quadratic formula is, and then making sure we're plugging in the a, the b, and the c correctly. From here, when we go to reduce this down, negative 10, we end up with plus or minus the square root of 10 squared is 100, minus 4 times 2 times 3 would give us 24. All over 2 times 2 is going to give us 4. Continuing to simplify inside of the square root, we end up with negative 10 plus or minus the square root of 76, all divided by 4. From here, I'm going to break this apart into two terms, because the square root of 76 is not going to be a perfect square, but we do want to think about if there's anything we can factor out. So breaking this apart into two terms, I have the negative 10 divided by the 4 plus or minus the square root of 76 divided by the 4. Now, what do you guys think? Can I first divide the 76 by the 4, or do I first have to simplify the square root? What do you guys think? So order of operations tells us that we have to first reduce down the square root of 76 if possible, and then divide by the 4 if we're able to take anything out of the square root. So let's factor 76. What are factors of 76? So 76 is divisible by 4 and 19. The reason I chose the 4 and not 2 right off the bat was because 4 is a perfect square. And so if I'm simplifying the square root of 76, well, that's going to be equal to the square root of 4 times 19. And the square root of 4 is a perfect square, and we would end up with a 2 then in front of the radical sign. And the 19, which is a prime number, is left over inside. So because the square root of 4 can reduce down, square root of 4 is equal to 2, and that comes in front of the radical sign. The negative 10 over 4 I can reduce as well, and that will give us a negative 5 halves. And then, of course, we still have the 2 times the square root of 19 divided by the 4. The next step we'd want to consider is if I can reduce down fractions anymore. 
So the negative 5 over 2 is reduced as far as that can go. And then the 2 times the square root of 19 over 4, I can only reduce if the coefficient on the square root is divisible by the number in the denominator. And in this case, 2 divided by 4 does reduce down to be 1 over 2. So our final answers that we end up with then is negative 5 over 2 plus or minus the square root of 19 all divided by 2. And the reason I'm not going to continue to simplify and try to add these together is negative 5 over 2 and negative 19 over 2 are not like terms and I can't combine the numerators anymore just besides writing it as one fraction. So we're going to leave that as our final answer then. We do have two answers here because of the plus or minus. So we have the negative 5 over 2 plus the square root of 19 over 2. And we also have the negative 5 over 2 minus the square root of 19 over 2. And those would be our two answers. I do want to go back and re-emphasize the fact that this 76 here, or anything underneath the radical, could not be divided by the number in the denominator. So up in example 2, this 100, I cannot divide by 2. I first have to simplify the square root as much as I can, and then do any division that is possible. All right, let's look at example 4. So example 4 says 3x squared plus 5x equals 4. This guy is not in standard form, so I'm going to go ahead and subtract the 4 to the other side, and get 3x squared plus 5x minus 4 equals 0. Why don't you guys pause the video, find your a, your b, and your c values, and then set up your quadratic formula. If we check this, our a value is 3, our b value is positive 5, and our c value is negative 4. Subbing this in, we end up with negative b, so negative 5, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 5 squared, minus 4 times the a value, which is 3, times our c value, which is negative 4, all over 2 times that a value. Again, this setup step is very important, so make sure you're checking it and have it all set up correctly. Simplifying stuff down, inside the square root we end up with a 25 from the 5 squared, and then negative 4 times 3 times negative 4 would give us a positive 48 all over 6 from the 2 times 3. Combining stuff inside that square root one last time, we end up with negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 73 all divided by 6. 73 is definitely not a perfect square, and there are actually no factors inside of it because 73 is a prime number. So the only other thing I can do is break this apart into our kind of our integer value term plus our irrational term. So we end up with negative 5 over 6 plus or minus the square root of 73 over 6. And technically this answer would work as well since the square root of 76 cannot be reduced anymore. I'm just trying to get us in the habit of breaking this apart into two terms, especially as you move on to an Algebra 2 class. There is stuff that you can do a little bit more with some of these, and it's helpful to have it in this uh, way. Okay, let's look at example 5. So in example 5, it says 9x squared plus 12x plus 4 equals 0. Again, I want you guys to pause the video, list your a, your b, and your c values, and then set up your quadratic equation. Checking this, we have our a value is 9, our b value is 12, and our c value is 4. So we end up with x equals negative b, so negative 12, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 12 squared minus 4 times a times c. All of that's underneath the square root, and then all divided by 2 times our a value, so 2 times 9. Double check your setup right here, and now I want you to pause the video and actually finish out this problem on your own first, and then we'll check it together. Okay, checking example 5, uh, if we simplify underneath the radical, we end up with 144 from 12 squared, and then negative 4 times 9 times 4 actually gives us a negative 144. 
all divided by 18. If I continue to simplify underneath the radical, we end up with negative 12 plus or minus the square root of 0, all divided by 18. Well, the square root of 0 is going to just give me 0, so I end up with negative 12 plus or minus 0 over 18. But there is no difference between adding 0 and subtracting 0, so I really just end up with negative 12 over 18, which we can reduce down to be negative 2 over 3. So in this last example that we just did, we actually only ended up with one answer. In our first four examples, we had two answers for each one of those. And in our fifth example, we only ended up with one answer. And the reason being was that we ended up with zero underneath our square root. So we end up doing plus or minus zero, which does not make a difference. So I just end up with one answer. And we saw in prior videos when we solved using other methods, there are times when our quadratic equation just has one answer. On a graph, we saw that when the um, quadratic equation just touches the x-axis once, since our x-axis does equal our solutions. And we also saw it when we use the zero product property, when we had two identical factors, we ended up with just one answer. Let's look at example six. So example six says x squared minus 2x plus 3 equals zero. This guy is already in standard form, so why don't you guys pause the video, decide on your a, your b, and your c values, and then set up the quadratic equation. In this example, our a value is 1, our b value is negative 2, and our c value is positive 3. So we end up with x equals negative times negative 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared, so negative 2 squared. Again, make sure you have the entire negative 2 that is being squared, because this will end up being a positive number, minus 4 times a times our c value. So all of that's underneath the radical, all divided by 2 times a. Simplifying down, negative times a negative 2 will actually give us a positive 2. And then we end up with plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared is going to be positive 4, minus 4 times 3 will give us 12, all over 2. Simplifying underneath the radical, we end up with the square root of negative 8. So we end up with 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 8 all over 2. Well, what's the square root of negative 8? The square root of negative 8 is not going to produce a real number because I cannot take the square root of negative numbers. So in this case, I actually get no solution since the square root of negative 8 will not produce a real number. So if I'm being very specific, I get no real solutions. And as you guys move on to an Algebra 2 class, you're going to learn about something called imaginary solutions. And this example does have imaginary solutions, but in our Algebra 1 class, we're just talking about real solutions. So example 6 then has no real solutions. And we saw some of these in past uh, videos as well when we ended up with similar situations with square roots of negative numbers, or if we had a graph that did not intersect the x-axis at all. Okay, so it's kind of led to this question, but our first question down here says, how many real solutions can a quadratic equation have? Well, a quadratic equation can have at most two solutions. So it can have two, it could also have one, like we saw in example five, or maybe it has no or zero real solutions. And that's okay. I definitely can't get more than two in a quadratic equation, but I could have one real solution or maybe no real solutions at all. What we're gonna finish talking about in this video is, is there a way to figure out how many solutions a quadratic equation has without actually solving for the solutions? So wouldn't it be nice if there was a way that I could kind of almost look at the equation, maybe do a little bit of work, and but not actually solve for the solutions and be able to say, yep, that guy has two solutions, that one has zero solutions, and this guy has one. Well, there is a way that we can do that. And the way we do that is called um, using the discriminant. And the discriminant is coming from that quadratic formula. So I'm going to write the quadratic formula here for reference. Remember, it's x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 
2 times a. So the discriminant is the stuff that is underneath the square root here. So this b squared minus 4ac. And the reason that that's so important is the square root really determines how many solutions we're going to end up getting. If we had a positive number underneath here, like we did in examples 1 through 4, we ended up with two solutions. If we ended up with zero underneath the square root, like we did in example five, we actually just got one solution. And then in this last example, in example six, if the number underneath the square root was negative, we ended up with no real solutions. So although I can't just look at it, look at the quadratic equation and be able to determine right away how many solutions, I can do a minimal amount of work and just calculate what b squared minus 4ac is equal to to determine the number of real solutions. So I have a little chart for us down here and I want to connect this back to what we've talked about before. So I'm going to leave this, that all of that up there. So we have three cases. We have the case where the discriminant, so the b squared minus 4ac is positive. We have the case where the b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero. And our last case is where that b squared minus 4ac is actually a negative number. And we've done examples with this. So if we look back, examples one through four were when that discriminant value was positive. Example number five was when that discriminant value was zero. And then example number six is where that value ended up being negative. And the reason that's gonna be helpful is so we can see each one of these cases. Now if I look at the quadratic formula here in this first case, if the stuff underneath the square root is a positive number, then I get something plus or minus a positive over a number. That's when we're getting two real solutions. Okay? And what that translates to on a graph then is remember that our solutions, another name for those are our x-intercepts. So I would be looking at some graph where I intersect the x-axis twice. So here on this graph that I just drew, I have two places where we're intersecting that x-axis. Let me actually redraw that and just fill in those circles. So I have one place right here and then another place over here. So that's producing two solutions. Another example of this would be maybe be a graph that is upside down. So it's facing downward. Remember our parabolas can face downward if our leading coefficient or that a value is negative. But in both of these, because I have two x-intercepts, that tells me that I get two solutions. So we can see how, although we have different methods for solving these, they all do still correlate. Our graphs and our x-intercepts were our solutions, and that was one way to solve. Using the quadratic formula, it's another way to solve, but still I would end up with two solutions in both of these cases, regardless of what method we're using to solve. And now in our second case here, if the discriminant, so the b squared minus 4ac, which again is that stuff underneath the radical, so if that number happened to be zero, then I only get one solution because adding zero and subtracting zero doesn't produce anything different. This is the case where I just have one x-intercept. So maybe I have a graph facing up that intersects once right there, or if I have a graph that's facing down that intersects once right there. So in this case, it was one x-intercept so that we got one solution. From the quadratic formula perspective, that's where the b squared minus 4ac would be equal to zero. Then in this last case over here, when our number underneath the radical sign was a negative number, so if b squared minus 4ac is a negative number, I end up with zero real solutions. And we saw that in example six. On a graph, what that would look like is that I have a graph either completely above the x-axis or I have a graph that is completely below the x-axis and facing downward. And in this case, I have zero x-intercepts, which implies zero real solutions then. So we can see the correlation here between our other methods from our graphing to the quadratic formula and then calculating this b squared minus 4ac term, which we call the discriminant.
what we're going to do is a couple more examples where instead of actually solving for the solution, so I don't care what the solutions are, I just want to determine how many. I want to determine if I have two real solutions, one real solution, or no real solutions. What this is going to come down to is I have to calculate this b squared minus 4ac. If that number is positive, then I automatically get two real solutions. If b squared minus 4ac equals zero, then I get one real solution. And if b squared minus 4ac is negative, then I get zero real solutions. Okay. Now in all of these, we could solve for what the solutions are, but the purpose of these questions isn't to figure out what the solutions are, just how many solutions that we have. Okay. So let's look at these. And on the side, I'm gonna just kind of write for reference what we knew. So we knew if b squared minus four ac is bigger than zero, then I get two solutions. If b squared minus four ac equals zero, then we get one solution. And if b squared minus four ac is less than zero, so if this is a negative number, then I get zero solutions then. We can use that as reference when we do these. Let's start with example seven. So it says, without solving for the solutions, determine the number of real solutions. I need to make sure that we're in standard form. So to get this question into standard form, I'm gonna add five to both sides. So we end up with two x squared minus three x plus five equals zero. Why don't you guys pause the video and find your a, your b, and your c values. So our a value here is two, our b value is negative three, and our c value is positive five. Instead of using the entire quadratic equation, I am just gonna calculate what the part underneath the square root is. So the b squared minus four ac. Subbing these in, we end up with negative three squared minus four times a, which is two, times our c, which is equal to five. Simplifying, negative three squared gives us nine, minus, well four times two is eight, and then eight times five is gonna give us 40. Then nine minus 40 will give us negative 31. So in this case, did I end up with a positive number in this first case? Did I end up with zero, or did I end up with a negative number? So in this case, we ended up with a negative number, so negative 31 is less than zero, so that tells me that I get no real solutions then. Since the question just asked for the amount of real solutions, we have answered the entire question since there are none of them. Okay, right, let's look at example eight. So example eight says six x squared minus five x equals seven. Is that in standard form? So this guy is not in standard form because I would need all the terms on one side. So I need to subtract seven and now we're in standard form. Why don't you guys pause the video, find your A, your B and your C values and then sub that in to this B squared minus four AC and then we'll check it. So our A value here is six, our B value is negative five and our C value is gonna be negative seven. When we sub these in, we get negative five squared minus four times six times negative seven. From here, I'm gonna to continue to simplify it. Why don't you guys pause and check and make sure that you agree with how those got subbed in and then simplify it on your own first. So to simplify this guy, negative five squared gives us 25. And then negative four times six times a negative seven is gonna give me plus a number, and I'll end up with plus 168. Simplifying that down, I end up with 193. So are we in this first case where I have a positive number? Are we in the second case where we got zero? Or are we in the third case where we got a negative number? So in this case, we are in the first one where we got a positive number. So that tells me that we have two real solutions. And it doesn't matter what the two real solutions are, I just needed to be able to find the amount of solutions. 
And since b squared minus 4ac, which is the stuff underneath the radical, since that was a positive number, then I know that I will always have two real solutions. Okay, I'm gonna try to leave the stuff on the side but show example nine at the same time. So example nine says x squared minus four x plus four equals zero. Why don't you guys pause the video and figure out what b squared minus four ac is gonna be equal to. If we go ahead and check this, I'm gonna first list our a, b, and c values. So a is one, b is negative four, and c is positive four. Substituting these in, we get negative four squared minus four times our a value is one times our c value, which is four. Do need a little bit more space. Negative four squared is gonna give us positive 16. And then negative four times one times a four will give us negative 16. 16 minus 16 is gonna give us zero. So we're actually in the second case here where I'm equal to zero, and this tells me that I automatically get one real solution then. And that's because the number underneath the square root, that b squared minus 4ac, was equal to zero. So when I'm looking at the quadratic formula, I have that negative b, so in this case negative negative four, plus or minus the square root of zero all over our two times a, so square root of zero doesn't do anything, it's still just zero, so I only end up with one real solution then. So in this last video in unit nine, we learned about the quadratic formula, which will work to solve any quadratic equation, but it also might not be the most effective route to solve a quadratic equation. If we scroll back up and look at our other methods that we have, there is always graphing, but most importantly, we do have that square root method that would be the quickest anytime you have a b value that's not equal to zero. And then there's also the zero product property, which will be the quickest method anytime you could factor a quadratic equation. But when in doubt, we do have the quadratic uh, formula to either solve, or if we were unsure about one of our prior methods, we could use another method to check that work and see if we got the same answer. Because regardless of what method you use, you should still end up with the same answers for every quadratic equation that, or for that quadratic equation that you're solving. The second part of this video talked about how to determine the number of real solutions, and that is based off of what we call the discriminant, which is the b squared minus 4ac part, or the stuff that is underneath the radical. If that number is positive, we'll always get two real solutions. If the number underneath the radical is equal to zero, we'll get one real solution. And if the number underneath the radical is less than zero, then we'd get no real solutions since I cannot take the square root of a negative number and get a real answer out. We then connected that to the graph so that we could see what was going on at the beginning of this unit when we looked at how to graph these. So this is the end of unit nine for us.